Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another uh, conclusion video here. We're going to take a look at final prices from the recent Rock Island auction. Uh, and today we're going to look at uh, some examples of how some guns, why some guns bring more money than others. This, for example, Valmet 82, brought about half of what a Valmet 62 would have brought, despite being a bit rarer because, well, it's kind of ugly and horrible. Um, on the other hand, speaking of ugly and horrible, uh, the Thompson brought over $60,000 because of its connection to uh, the Thompson name, the Colt name, the U.S. military, where this was actually a rifle that was tested, and those connections make up for the fact that the gun was basically a complete failure. And speaking of complete failures, same sort of thing here. If these had rifles had been made by anyone other than Smith & Wesson, they wouldn't have, have been, they wouldn't be worth nearly what they bring today. Uh, now, it's kind of interesting to me, the Mark I, um, which was it? That one of these was actually a bit rarer than the others, but they brought pretty much the same amount. Now, the Suomi here actually is another good example of this. This brought kind of a little bit on the high end, but kind of typical money for a World War II submachine gun, unless you're talking about a German one, in which case you can kind of just double the price range just because it's German, despite the fact that a gun like the Suomi is arguably better than most of the other submachine guns from World War II. Uh, snipers are kind of going to be in a, a realm of their own. Uh, the the World War One pattern here, or I'm sorry, the World War Two pattern, brought really quite a lot of money because it was in perfect condition. All of the features are correct. It's not as difficult to find an L42 with all of the correct features because the L42s didn't really go through the same sort of upgrade process and wartime World War Two wartime use. So. Uh, that's why these are uh, these are cheaper, the 42s. Uh, they were surplused in this condition, and, and they actually are a bit easier to find. Uh, Styr M95 carbines are extremely difficult to find, and just based on rarity, ought to be the most expensive of all of these three snipers. However, not nearly as many people are interested in firearms from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that drives the price down. We're going to see a much really blatant example of this in a minute. Uh, it's not this one. Uh, this is just... Honestly, this went higher than I would have expected it to, but hey, these every one of these pistols is specifically tied to a U.S. Army general officer, and eh, they're, they're a cool military pistol that is relatively scarce. Now, I was talking about a glaring example of nationality affecting value. Here you go. Um, this was the, it's a live registered destructive device. Uh, a French 50mm light mortar from just before World War II went for 1700 bucks. By the way, I own a deactivated one of these that I paid about half that for, so not a whole lot of premium for a live one. Well, if we get a German 50mm light mortar from just before World War II, what does it bring? $18,000. And it's in every way a worse firearm, a worse design than the French one. It's way too heavy, it's complicated. And it was kind of a failure on the battlefield, but because it's German, it brings a lot more money. Uh, the bazooka kind of falls in the middle. Um, American stuff, especially for an American audience, does tend to bring a premium. And yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are going to note that this is basically a piece of, you know, three dollar steel tubing that's worth seventy five hundred bucks because it's a registered destructive device. But hey, bazookas are cool. Now the the German howitzer here brought a lot of money forty three thousand dollars despite being a deactivated gun because I believe this one wouldn't be all that difficult to reactivate. And unlike machine guns, destructive devices can be manufactured new and added to the registry still today. So uh, something like this or like the Bofors that we will see a little later on. Uh, in theory, if all the parts are there, and depending on how it was deactivated, it can be made live again. And I think that's why this one brought so much money. Now, uh, the Luger with the stock, remember this was, uh, they were sold separately. So the Luger itself with the grips, 1200 bucks, pretty typical for a standard Luger of that type. The stock itself worth four grand, because, well, there are a lot more Lugers out there than there are uh, of those stocks. Looking at some of the more antique guns, we had this uh, pair of three-barreled Rigby Derringers that went for 10 grand, which is, uh, I would think, quite a lot. That's a little more than I was expecting, but then again, if you go and uh, check out Rigby's prices for almost anything that they make today, they're also quite steep. There's a lot of, uh, of name recognition in that. Uh, Marston's pistol here, $3,000. Uh, 
there are a lot of early American patterns of pistol, and being an American gun in an American audience, this sort of thing, uh, there are a lot of people who are collecting this sort of thing. So this one, that, that one doesn't surprise me all that much. I think that's pretty typical. Uh, the Alsop went for twice as much, more than that, 7500 bucks. Uh, largely, I expect, because of its condition. There are only a couple hundred of these made, and this one is in really nice condition. It's pretty rare to find these with much at all of their original bluing left. And this is one of the better examples I've ever seen, which, of course, is going to drive its price up. Uh, same thing would hold for the Enfield if it were in better shape, but this one's a, a kind of worn example. Being a Mark I was cool. There are fewer of those than a lot of other patterns, but um, British Imperial pattern revolvers, the early Enfields and then all the Webleys, are going up in value, and so we see almost three grand for this one. Uh, the Camp Perry here went for way more than a sort of typical normal condition Colt Camp Perry would because it was both in quite good condition, talking about the finish and grips and everything, and it was also a pre-production uh, serial number. This was with a Colt letter and, and that sort of thing. People are probably going to wonder why this one didn't go higher because it is a literal one of a kind. Well, the answer is it's a one of a kind that didn't lead anywhere. It's not a complete gun, really. This, you can see right there, it's missing a few little bits. This is very much an experimental tool room uh, trial piece, and those don't generally bring as much money. Now, I mentioned uh, Webley's and the other British revolvers are going up in price. Uh, the 1889 is a, a fairly rare pattern. They only made those for a little while. Uh, so that that brought in, geez, $3,500. Um, the others that we are going to see in this from this WG series uh, are not quite so expensive. Uh, the target there uh, was brought down because that nickel finish is was not in the greatest condition. And you can see here what something like condition can do to the value of a gun. So even the army isn't all that great. You know, we're not talking 95, 98% there, but the nickel was just substantially worse. Uh, and we have about the same level on this army, but it's got the target, the square grip of the target model. So, um, Again, we're talking about a, a gun that was only made for about 20 years total, um, over 100 years ago. And, and they're cool looking guns, and there are a lot of people out there collecting them. Uh, not as many people as collect Colts, naturally. Uh, and the Bisley target is substantially scarcer than the just Bisley model. Now, there aren't a whole lot of differences between the two. It's pretty much just the sights. But that's enough to drive the price of the target model up to more than double that of the standard Bisley. It's interesting to look, you know, this actually, this is another example of nationality contributing to value. Uh, the HK G3 semi-auto rifles from this same period are worth five times as much as the Setmes from this period because, well, this is Spanish and that one's German and anything German just gets a premium to it. Uh, I mentioned we would take a look at the Bofors gun. 23 grand, I think uh, that is for a couple factors. Obviously, this is also deactivated, and it's probably not going to be as easy to reactivate. Also, this is, there's just a lot of logistics involved in owning something like this. Uh, you have to have a place to put it where it's protected and sheltered, or you're going to lose all its value. So big artillery pieces like that often don't have as much intrinsic value just for the logistics. Uh, the Automag here, this is really what I would have expected. Um, there is a definite cult following for Automags, and this was a really nice, really early example. Uh, almost at the end here, one last uh, interesting conundrum here, and that is we have a 1924 Trials M1 Garand, a primer actuated rifle that went for a fantastic $172,000. By the way, I'm really glad I didn't break it when I took it apart. Um, to me, this is by far the more interesting of the expensive Garands that Rock Island had. The other one, which I didn't do a video on, was this one. It was serial number 1 million, and it was presented to John Garand uh, by the Army um, in 1953 when he retired, or by Springfield. Uh, and this one sold for more than $100,000 more than the Trials gun. And so there is there's something to be discussed there of which is worth more, the gun that has sort of the the name recognition there? You know, is it more interesting to have the gun that was owned by the inventor, despite the fact that I bet he didn't ever really do anything with it except let it sit in that case, and it happens to have serial number one million, but of course that's just, just another number to me. 
Um, or is it more interesting to have the trials gun that is mechanically different and was actually a an integral part of the development of the gun? So, of course, we can see the result here on the, the current American market. John Guerin's rifle is substantially more desirable than the prototype. Uh, now, there is also something to be said for the fact that there's only one of serial number 1 million, where in theory, there are another 20 or so of those uh, primer actuated 1924 pattern guns floating around somewhere, but I don't know that more than one or two other 1924s actually exist, so they're pretty close to the exact same scarcity. Anyway, um, leave uh, leave it with uh, with that for you guys. A couple interesting things to ponder about uh, what actually drives the value of a collectible firearm. Thanks for watching.